start this recording. And all right. So, Hannah, I, I think this was your question, right? How do you know if it's a bulky base? So the the main the main way we know something like that is, is I and mean, we can look at what's attached to whatever the basic group is. Morning, guys. Um, I mean, anytime you've got several different R groups attached to the same to the same base, it's probably going to be considered bulky. We kind of have a couple that we use as our sort of common triggers. Um, TBOK, um, or as I was reminded as I was prepping for this, is um, also occasionally just referred to as TBOK. Um, is uh, that's one of the more common ones, but there's also basically anytime you've got something that it can accept a, a proton and nitrogen is really commonly used for that. And nitrogen can have three R groups and still have a lone pair um, that can accept the proton. So anything that looks like this, or if it's diisopropylamine, Um, or, you know, T-butyl oxide. Those are all big bulky. We, we just kind of have a couple that are sort of the most common ones that we refer to the mo most often. Um, and basically the most common one for this class is gonna be T-butyl It's gonna be that T-butyl group attached to an oxide. So it's basically, it's T-butyl alcohol that's been deprotonated. So any, any deprotonated alcohol, like methoxide here, are pretty strong bases. Methoxide, ethoxide, isopropoxide. I guess it'd be two propanol. Two. Let's see how would you name that? The rules get a little bit different because you actually name them not as an alcohol, but the deprotonated form of two propanol. Um, as you start getting these groups that are attached to the oxygen larger and larger is when we would start considering it to be a steric standard. And it's really, it's a, it's a sliding scale. And with the TPO, okay, it's not like it's all or nothing. It automatically switches 100% to the Hoffman product. It just makes it the Hoffman product more common. So instead of being 70-30 for the Zaitsev product, we get 70-30 for the Hoffman product. If we got bigger groups attached to it, it would get even more in favor of the Hoffman product. So it's not like there's one single trigger, but as far as for this class, picking a major product, basically look for a couple of those major examples. And they're on the, in the, um, uh, in the textbook at the end of the chapter, let me pull up the textbook real quick. Um, basically all the ones that are strong bases, but weak nucleophiles are gonna be most of your sterically hindered bases because what makes them a weak nucleophile is the fact that they're sterically hindered, that they have these big groups that prevent them from getting to the active carbon. Too much spinach, Too much spinach exactly. I think it would be, yeah, methyl ethoxide might be like a methyl ethyl group. I bet that you probably find um, people that call it isopropoxide as well though. So strong base, weak nucleophile, they have DBN and DBU. Um, but their TBOC should be on there as well. And there the um, that uh, cheat sheet from West Virginia is on there, is going to, um, has that list as well. 
yeah, it's a pretty handy, uh, handy little resource. Let me see if I could pull that back up again. No, wait. There it is. These two right here, diisopropyl amide and, and TBOC are the ones that are specifically called out on this sheet as being serically hindered, strong bases, weak nucleophiles, only E2. Last one, that's a good. There it is. All right. Couple other questions about the quizzes. Um, so somebody else brought up the fact that our our cheat sheet from the end of the chapter material. This one says that if it's a weak base, weak nucleophile and secondary carbon for our leaving group, that it's no reaction. That's the one that I hedged on last week. Um, if you remember, it's if you can get that to happen. It's just going to take a while. Um, and probably elimination is probably more common than um, than substitution, just because you can raise the temperature to make the reaction happen faster, and then drive the react the um, products towards or drive equilibrium towards the products. Um, you, it's it's not common. It's not something we would want to do at an industrial level because it would be so slow. But it's something that the bench scale in a lab you could do if that was the if it was faster to spend a week waiting for this reaction to happen than it was to go through five different steps and get a oh you know the same yield. Um, so it's on the uh, on the quiz. It did imply that there was going to be products. And, you know, I would probably would not have marked anybody wrong if you said, well, based on my understanding, there should be no products. But the best answer was, well, low temperature favors substitution, weak base, weak nucleophile means it's first order and kind of go that route, even though it's not going to be a great yield and it's not going to be quick. Um, and then somebody asked about temperature, since I'm bringing up temperature, I was leaning towards S one said it was heated in water, no higher heat favors elimination reactions. That's exactly it, right? At higher temperatures, we're going to favor, if you, if you have some equilibrium happening and you raise the temperature, you're going to shift to, towards the side of the reaction that has more molecules because that's going to be the side that has the higher entropy. And remember that our, our equilibrium constant is based on delta G and delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Well, delta H generally favors making substitutions because sigma bonds are more stable than, than um, pi bonds. But elimination reactions have a higher delta S or more favorable delta S. So basically for, for this class, we're gonna use high temperature, low temperature as sort of a, a trigger, a clue, like, okay, high temperature, I should be thinking elimination. If everything else is equal, high temperature should, should make you think elimination, low temperature should make you think substitution. All right, and since we have at least one of the people who asked, asked these questions, two of you asked questions about chlorinating water. So I thought I'd address those real quick. Um, somebody asked about saltwater pools versus chlorinated pools. Um, turns out saltwater pools are chlorinated. 
they're just not chlorinated the same way. Traditional chlorination for pools and hot tubs, um, basically it relies on adding um, chlor, I think it's chlorates, it might be chlorites um, to the water in a certain level. And when they're exposed to heat, they decompose to form chlorine gas in really small amounts that stays dissolved in the water mostly, but not entirely because you can smell it. Um, what saltwater pools do instead is they, they just add salt um, to as an electrolyte. And then it actually, when water is pumped through and it goes through the heater as well, it also gets passed through, through a chamber um, that uses voltage and electrical current to generate chlorine from the chloride that's in there from the salt. So you generate the chlorine directly by oxidizing chloride. Um, but in the advantage to that is that it's not a time release mechanism. It happens right there. You can chlorinate the heck out of all that water and then it dissipates very, very quickly. By the time water gets back to the rest of the pool, it's been sanitized, um, but it doesn't have the smell of chlorine as much. So it's better for your skin. Um, so it's, and it's been around since the seventies, it's just getting more and more common. The problem is it's more and more, it's more expensive. Um, and it's, it's harder to maintain because if that little, if that electrolysis cell goes out, it's really expensive to replace it. Whereas chlorinating a pool the traditional way, just dump a bunch of chlorate salts into the water, keep those salts at, at the right level and you get the right amount of chlorine. Um, for that temperature. So it's a lot easier and lower maintenance to do traditional chlorine pools. But saltwater pools are, I don't think anybody would would say, would disagree with me saying that saltwater pools are better in general. They're better experience for people swimming in them. They're, they don't give you skin problems as much. You don't breathe chlorine as much. How does the bromine fit into that scenario? So bromine, you typically, it gets used the exact same way that chlorine does, except that um, the bromides um, break down slower, or bromates break down slower than chlorates. Um, and so bromates get used in hot tubs where you have higher temperature because the higher temperature makes them break down faster than they would in a pool. You wouldn't want to use bromine in a pool because the temperatures are too low and your levels of your halogen would be too low then to disinfect it. You wouldn't want to use chlorine in a hot tub because it would break down too quickly and you'd, you'd wind up generating a lot too much chlorine gas too quickly. Um, and it wouldn't have that time delay aspect to it. Um, you can shock a hot tub with chlorine. It works really well. It's just, you don't want to get in it for 24 hours. When I played water polo in high school, we, uh, they shocked the pool, meaning they just dumped a whole bunch of chlorate into the pool over the weekend thinking nobody was using it, but we had practice on that that Saturday um, and uh, the coach wasn't having any of us um, you know, wussing out. And so we, we swam in it anyway. My lungs didn't feel right for a while after that. Um, when it comes to adding chlorine to water, to sanitize water, it's the same basic principle except that they remove most of the chlorine before it gets actually to your tap. Um, so because they're, if your pipes are sanitary, there's not really any risk of, of getting any dangerous bacteria in between the water treatment plant and your house. And so they can basically just sanitize it with chlorine at the water treatment facility. They'll, they leave a little bit in there to keep it clean, but it's basically below the threshold for you to taste or for it to be harmful. Um, there really are not a whole lot of disadvantages unless you're trying to use that tap water to brew beer. Um, because you might not be able to taste the chlorine, but Chlorine will react with the polyphenols that are in uh, malted barley to make chlorinated polyphenols, which are your, your uh, body can taste at a much lower threshold than just chlorine or chlorates. So you actually can make from water that tastes really good, you can make beer that tastes really bad if you're using chlorinated tap water. There's another uh, disadvantage. What's that? I couldn't think of any other sweat. Any amount of chlorine around any amount of organic material. The thermodynamically favored product is chloroform, and that's like the carcinogen and uh, 
group I do not have this right now in the docket. And uh, pretty much any municipal water supply that are feeding chlorine have measurable amounts of chloroform. And uh, that's like something that you breathe in when you're showering, especially. Is it measurable to the point that are to uh, harmful levels for humans or just as a chronic? Um, over time. Over time. Which everyone. Showers. Yeah. That is, that does happen. <laughs> That'd be, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there was. So my, my instinct is that the, the low levels of chloroform over a long period of time is maybe a significant significant carcinogen, but less so than most other things that are carcinogens that are, we have in our lives. Um, you smoke anything regularly, that's worse for you than, that's a bigger carcinogen than, my, this is my, my gut instinct. I'm not saying that, that this is right or that uh, it's not a concern. It's probably just less of a concern than dirty water and other carcinogens coming from other places. It's a really small amount. Probably the ability to metabolize Yeah, that's that's that is a good one to pay attention to because I had not I did not remember that when I answered your question right. All I could come up with was you can't use it for brewing beer. Yeah, good enough. Um let's see. So let's we're gonna start by talking about NMR a little bit today. Um, and so a reminder of how NMR works, I'm just going to go to an NMR spectrum here um, that we can look at while we're, we're talking about this. Um, NMR is looking for at protons, specifically at the hydrogens in these molecules, um, assuming it's proton NMR. We'll talk next quarter, we'll talk about carbon-13 NMR, which behaves a little bit differently, uses the same principles, but you interpret it a little differently. And then in the third quarter, we'll talk about two-dimensional NMR, where you can do one type of proton NMR on one axis and a different type of proton NMR on another axis. And you can look at what happens in a two-dimensional plot, and that tells you more things. Um, for now, we're just looking at proton NMR. Um, and the four main things that an NMR spectrum tells us is one, how many distinct protons we have, the integration, I think this is slightly different order than it was in your notes, but it's okay, I'll get to them. Um, integration of each of the signals is proportional to the number of hydrogens making up that signal. So if you look at the integration of each signal, which is represented here with these red lines. Um, the length or the change in height of the red line is going to be proportional to the number of hydrogens. So basically, since we have to have integer number of hydrogens, you can be, look at your smallest increase in the integral and call that one. And that should give you whole number ratios of all the others. And if it doesn't, it's probably because it's not one, it's two. In which case, because if this is, if I say this is one and this looks like it's one and a half, well, it can't be one and a half. It's got to be a whole number. So maybe this was two and that's really three. So if you don't get whole number integrations, and you might, you might even need to get out a ruler and measure these um, to and write down your actual lengths that you're measuring so that you can see what those ratios are rather than eyeballing it. Um, but so that's a really important piece though, because that tells us a lot. Not only does it tell us how many distinct hydrogens we have in the molecule, the integration tells us how many hydrogens are in each of those signals. Um, the chemical shift, basically how far to the right or the left it is, tells us a lot about where the electron density is because the further it is to the left, the more de-shielded it is. So the more, the 
closer it is to an electron withdrawing group to something really electronegative. Um, and again, there's certain functional groups have very distinct um, areas where they show up. For instance, uh, aldehydes, the hydrogen on an aldehyde always shows up between, I think it's between 10 and 11. And the, and the hydrogen on a carboxylic acid group always shows up at about 13, way over here. Methyl groups always show up right around one or less than one. And so it's all about how much electron density is around those hydrogens. That's what gives you your chemical shift. And then the last one is called multiplicity. or peak splitting, right? And so that's the way that one signal will turn into multiple peaks that are all kind of vaguely bell curve shaped. For instance, it's a little bit hard to see here, but there's if you zoom in on this one, one, two, three, four, five peaks that are all part of the same signal. And you see there, I mean, you kind of have to use your imagination a little bit because it's pretty steep, but it's, the whole thing is vaguely bell curve shaped. When you look at the height of the peaks, that's all one signal. And the splitting tells us something as well, but the splitting, tells us how many hydrogens are attached to the next door carbons, the carbons adjacent to, the, to these hydrogens. All right, so that's a lot of information. And this one in particular is kind of tricky to wrap your head around. Um, and it's not always 100% reliable because things like having hydrogens attached to an oxygen instead of a carbon mess with that because they're not the same energy levels anymore. And so they can't interfere with each other the same way. So an, a hydrogen on an alcohol group is not going to affect peak splitting the same way that a hydrogen attached to a carbon does. So it's a little bit trickier and it always follows that N plus one rule. If there are two adjacent hydrogens, there's three ways energetically that you can have those hydrogens line up. They can both be pointed up, they can both be pointed down, or one could be up and one could be down. So if there's two adjacent hydrogens, there should be three peaks when it splits. And that's why it follows that bell curve shape, because you can have up, up, say that that's the highest energy, and you could have down, down, that's the lowest energy. You could have up, down, or you could have down, up. And there, so there's two possibilities that are energetically the same. So they show up on top of each other. And as you add more adjacent hydrogens, you get something that looks like Pascal's triangle, basically a, a normal distribution, aka a bell curve. Right, so the bell curve gets more obvious the more peaks you have, um, but it, and it's always going to follow that n plus one rule because that's the number of distinct arrangements that you could have. And so if you think about just because I think statistics is full cool, probability is cool, we have three of them. You have up, up, up. You could have up up, down, or up, down, up, or down, up, up. Then do the same thing right next to it. It'd be the same numbers, the, the same number of possibilities for having two down and one up. There'd be three possibilities. Then there's one possibility for all three being down. So, as you add any, so there'd be four distinct energy levels then if you have three adjacent hydrogens. It's always going to follow that. It's just based purely on the probability, on the number of possible states. All 
All right, so on for this practice slide, it was basically match each of the peaks. If I give you the molecule and an NMR spectrum, it's usually not too tricky to try and match up. Okay, here are all my distinct hydrogens. Which ones go with which peak? Um, and generally, especially if you already know what the structure is or you have an idea what the structure is, there should be more than one way to think about it that should agree with you. Or they, they, all the different ways of assigning this should give you the same results. They should agree with each other. Is what I mean. So for instance, I can look at this one right here and say, okay, well, this one has the smallest integration. So therefore it's one hydrogen. There's only one of, there's four distinct hydrogens on this molecule, only one of those is just one hydrogen by itself. So just based on the integration, I can say that this peak is that hydrogen. And that should agree with something like the chemical shift and the multiplicity. The chemical shift would say that the high, this hydrogen should be furthest to the left because it's closest to the chlorine. Closest to the chlorine means it um, has more of its electron density pulled away from it. So it's the most de-shielded. And that also agrees that this peak is that hydrogen. And then last but not least, if we looked at the multiplicity, actually, this hydrogen, before we start counting peaks, this hydrogen, if it's that peak, it should have, it has one, two, three, four, five nearest neighbors. So that means it should be a sextuplet, that, that peak splitting, we should have six peaks within that signal because it has five nearest neighbors. So if we go down and look, see if I can zoom in even a little more. No, it won't let me zoom in anymore. One, two, three, four, five, six. So again, all three different ways that we could have, we could have done this just by looking at the peak splitting. It wouldn't have been quite as obvious as the other two ways of thinking about it. But there's only one, hydrogen on this molecule that has five nearest neighbors. Brad? Just the hydrogens. Only the hydrogens show up in the peak splitting because only the hydrogens have close enough to the same energy level that they can cause that, that uh, diffraction like that. All right, so all three of our different ways of thinking about it all agree that the, the peak that's furthest to the left should be this hydrogen. Now, and if you have a sheet of characteristic IR or uh, NMR frequencies, which uh, one of the ones that I like to use, is one looks like this it's compound compound interest. Um, and it's got a fair bit of detail on it. Whoa. I'll let my poor computer catch up here. There it goes. Basically, pretty much all of the methyls are gonna show up all the way to the right. And the nice thing about methyls is one, they show up all the way to the right, and two, they have a really distinct integration, right? Because a methyl, as if it has three hydrogens, it's basically the only thing that will show up with an integration of three is gonna be a methyl group, right? Because you can't have three hydrogens on the same carbon any other way. So methyl groups are pretty distinctive once you know what you're looking for. And pretty much all of the other, any secondary carbon hydrogens are gonna show up to the left of your methyls. They're mostly gonna be left. This can all change though, depending on what electron withdrawing groups we have, what electronegative elements or functional groups we have around. But that allows us to 
look and say, well, I would expect that these two are both gonna have integrations of three and they are probably the furthest ones to the right. Now this methyl that's close to the chlorine versus this secondary carbon, those might get a little bit close together. They might, we can't say 100% that the methyl is gonna to be to the right of that one because it's so close to this chlorine. But that's what we would expect to see. And so if I find my mouse again, we zoom out here. Just looking at these three, this is a methyl group almost certainly because it's furthest to the right. Even without even looking at the integration though, it's got peak splitting of three, right? Which means that's two nearest neighbors. Only one of these two methyls fits that, right? That methyl group has two nearest neighbors. So we would expect a triplet three peaks together for this methyl, but not for this one. This methyl only has one nearest neighbor, hydrogen. So we would expect a doublet for this methyl. And it's closer to the chlorine, so we would expect it to be further to the left than that methyl. We put all those together, both of those piece, ways of thinking both agree with each other. This peak has, is a doublet, it has two peaks, it's further to the left, it's more de-shielded than this one. This one has is a triplet and it's more shielded. So we can say this group of three are responsible for that signal. This group of three is that signal. which means we only have one more choice for this CH2, right? But it should still, using process of elimination is helpful, but it should still make sense. This one has how many nearest neighbors that are hydrogens? Four, so how many peaks should we see? Five, N plus one. So our last signal and CH2s are supposed to be further to the left, more de-shielded than methyl groups. So it should be further to the left than these two. It should have five peaks. The integration should be double the integration for this one, which just eyeballing it looks about right. So all of our pieces of information still agree with each other. And so when you when I give you the structure, it's not that bad to interpret these, right? When you already know what the structure is. When you don't know the structure is when it gets a little bit tricky. And in that case, one of the things that's really helpful is basically make a list of what isomers it could be based on what other, what other information you have. You, you're pretty much never gonna be given an NMR spectrum in a vacuum, by which I mean, you're gonna know something else about the molecule. You might also have an IR spectrum is really common. These two, two of the first instruments that you're taught to use um, when you go to a, a real lab um, that has resources. The problem with NMR, proton NMRs, even the cheap ones cost about 50 grand. Um, which is just not in our budget here. And I, cheap IR costs about 20 grand. Um, that's used for right now. We're looking at whether we can get grants and we're talking about using some of this HSI money to get maybe a real um, IR. We had one that's been broken since before I got here. We, we finally got rid of it. So it was gonna cost five grand just to get it fixed and it was out of date. Is it fair to assume that you're almost always going to have a methyl because you're almost always going to have a CH3. If you have any part of your molecule is um, is aliphatic, is 
sp3 carbons you're almost guaranteed to have a methyl right because just probability or you know the, by the nature of having a carbon chain you have to have an end um so other than when you get if this chlorine was on one of the methyls that could change it because then it would be even more deshielded than it is and that could make it do something like move over to the left far enough that it overtook some of the CH2s potentially. But yeah, for the most part, what's on the far right, if your integration matches up, the integration is the way to know for sure, right? Because there's only one way you can get an integration of three. So if it's all the way to the far right and your integration looks like it's three or one and a half, um, then that tells you it's gonna be a methyl. So methyls are good to look for because they're really distinctive. And that can tell you something as well, because if I was looking at this, if we didn't have this peak here, so if I call that one, because it's my smallest peak, then when I go to measure these two, well, they're all the way to the right. So I would expect them to be methyl groups. And when I measure their integration, I get an integration of one and a half compared to this one instead of three. So that tells me right there that, oh, this can't be a one, this has to be a two because my methyls have to be threes. All right, so it gets a, a little tricky to watch out for that, but at the same time, it's a, there are some characteristic patterns to look for and the methyls showing up to the far right with an integration of three is one of those. All right, just to, to practice the N plus one rule, what would, the, what would the multiplicity of each signal look like for this molecule? So let's go through, rather you can write the multiplicity just as a number, as the number of peaks we would expect to see, but you could also practice drawing in a, you know, sort of a bell curve shape what those, peaks should look like. And oops, I'll zoom in on this. So first off, find all of your distinct hydrogens. Anything that's symmetrical, that's identical, is all going to show up as one signal, no matter how many you have. So each of those blue lines is a hydrogen. First off, how many signals would we expect to see? Let me recount it because I got five. These two methyls are identical, so they're going to show up as one signal. And these three methyls are identical, so they're going to show up as one signal. And then this is where the integration of three can throw you off a little bit because you could get something that looked like an integration of three, but really it's nine. Right? Because it's three methyls on top of each other. So I get one, that's a distinct signal. So that's two, that's distinct from that. So three and four, five. And this carbon doesn't have any hydrogens on it. All right, so anything where, and it goes back to counting your longest continuous carbon chain as well, right? We can count our longest continuous carbon chain starting here or here and still get the same number, right? Because these two are identical and all three of these methyls are identical, 
you can't tell the difference between this CH3 from that CH3. They're both the same distance away from the carbonyl, and they're both the same distance away from the end of the carbon chain. That is, they, they are the end of the carbon chain. So they should all show up identically. And so what would our multiplicity look like? How many peaks should we see for this one? What's the nearest neighbor? So these six are all going to show up in the same signal, but they only have one nearest neighbor. So a multiplicity of two. So if you double it with an integration of six, versus this one has six nearest neighbors. So that would make it a, I can't remember if it's a septuplet or a heptuplet. I think it's a septuplet. So seven peaks with an integration of one. And your seven peaks look something like If I counted right, I think that's seven. Right, so technically more bell curve, but if you can if you make them look like a triangle, that's not wrong really either. It's close enough for hand drawing something. And the multiplicity for these two, the integration would be for this one would be one. And for the first one we talked about, it would be a doublet, so two peaks the same height with an integration of six. So we would expect this one to be a lot smaller. And that's one of the other things about multiplicity that can be tough to read when you actually see these, is I'm gonna try to not give you any ambiguous NMR spectra. Um, but the, as you get to really high multiplicities, these lowest ones off to the side can get kind of hard to see. They kind of get lost in, in the noise sometimes. Um, and you're not quite sure if that's a peak, if that counts or not. That's one of those things that's a little bit tricky. What's our multiplicity look like for these two? How many nearest neighbors are there? Two nearest neighbors, so multiplicity of three, right? With an integration of two. And this one's gonna look really similar, right? Also, an integration of two, also only two nearest neighbors. So how can we tell the difference between them? Yeah, we can usually, if we want to try to avoid the double negatives, we talk about de-shielded more, but we could just say shielded. This one should be more shielded, this one more de-shielded is closer to that carbonyl group, that carbonyl group's electron withdrawing. So we would expect to see this one further to the left on our spectrum. And then these three are all gonna, or these nine protons are all gonna show up in the same signal. And how many nearest neighbors are there? zero, so multiplicity of one with an integration of nine. So the one big fat peak with no splitting. Furthest to the right, likely.
So again, just like if you have the structure and you have the spectrum, it's easy enough to match them up. It's actually, if you have the structure, it's actually pretty easy to draw what the NMR should look like as well. You just give it, you know, give it your best guess where things show up left to right based on shielding. And you can, we don't even have to be that, you don't have to be to scale when it comes to the integration because you can just say integration equals one or the other way of drawing it is you just put a kind of like an integral sign and write and write the number next to it. And just try to make the lines for those roughly to scale, but it's not that big of a deal, especially if we're dealing with integration of one all the way up to nine. It's kind of hard to actually get those perfectly to scale freehand. So you just label it right next to it. Um, and that'll actually be on your final next week. One of the problems, I'm not going to give you a, a mind-bending solve this structure with minimal information problem like your labs, but I am going to give you a structure and say, give, give it your best shot to draw the, the NMR for this. And I'm going to give you a multiple choice question where I give you the NMR and the IR. I'll give you five structures to go with an NMR and an IR, and you have to pick from the five structures um, and support your choice. Because if you just circle one and get it wrong, that's no partial credit, I guess, maybe two out of 10. Um, but if you if you get it wrong, but you can support your answer, then you can get still you know, a seven or an eight, you can get the wrong number or the wrong structure if you supported your answer. Brad? For the IR. Mm -hmm. Would you give us a table that shows? Yes. And I'm going to post this later today. Um, but I'm going to give you the uh, a practice test. That is the uh, final from two years ago. And so I'll give you, and this is actually from, that's a mass spec, not a uh, um, NMR. So that will be changed. I fix that before I give that to you because we didn't cover mass spec yet. Um, that will be the next one. But yeah, I'll give you a, a list of characteristic absorption frequencies for IR. And yeah, switch that out for a for an NMR. And then the other one is just if you have one fluoro three methyl butane, estimate roughly qualitatively what would the NMR look like? How many signals? What's the splitting look like? What's the integration look like? And where are they? Just like we just did. Right. So you still have to understand these four things in order to be able to do that properly. But it's it's also one thing that if I give you the structure or at least the name to get it at least close is not that hard. Chemical shift is probably the one that's the trickiest to estimate because you know where exactly do things switch over from the methyls being on the far right based on electronegativity and things like that. There's a little wiggle room get it close you don't i'm not going to grade you on how close you are to the real one i'm going to grade you on does your logic make sense the way we've talked about these it does chemical shift does because chemical shift of SP, so aliphatic, or sorry, allylic methyls show up further to the left than regular methyls because those pi bonds draw electron density away from the hydrogens. So things that are attached to um, alkenes are going to show up further to the left than normal alkanes. And so, Vanillic 
meaning the hydrogens that are actually attached to the double bond are all the way down here. Can't see the numbers here, but that's down around five. So well to the left, well downfield of any of the sp3 carbon hydrogens. And aromatic hydrogens show up between six and eight. So even further to the left. So it actually, those are actually really easy to spot once you know what you're looking for, because not very much shows up in that six to eight range other than aromatic carbon hydrogens. And typically you have more than one of them and splitting gets to be a mess because resonance messes with the splitting. And so you wind it with just sort of a mess of peaks sort of on top of each other right around seven. It's almost always going to be an aromatic ring. And then when you look at the integration, that can tell you, was well, that three carbon hydrogens? Or is that three hydrogens on the benzene ring? Or is it four hydrogens on a benzene ring? In other words, does that benzene ring have two substitutions or three substitutions or only one substitution? based on the integration. Even if you can't use the peak splitting for the aromatics, they're still really helpful um, in terms of, well, for starters, if you know the molecular formula, a benzene ring is almost always gonna be a significant chunk of carbons and hydrogens, right? So that right there limits what you can do with the rest of your formula. If you know that six out of your eight carbons have to be in a benzene ring. And so this, I remember feeling the first time I learned about NMR, like it wasn't as bad as mass spec. What mass spec is traditionally taught first, but I like it least. Um, so you're gonna learn it afterwards because I think it makes less sense and it feels more like you're just making stuff up. Um, but I do remember still for IR and NMR as well, just feeling like, well, I'm just like, Throwing stuff on a page. I don't know if any of this is right. It feels wrong because you're so used to solving chemistry problems and math problems in a, in a linear thinking sort of way. You start at point A, you do a process, you get to point B, right? That's not how these problems go. And the analogy I always use is that these are more like crossword puzzles where you're not going to get all, you're not going to, if any of you have ever done a crossword puzzle, you don't start at one across and go straight down your list of clues and get everything right, right? You get a few of them here and there, and then you look at the downs and you see what matches up and you get a few of them there. And then you go back to your across and you find a few more pieces there, right? And so it feels like you're just throwing stuff out there at first because you kind of are. And then you start trying to eliminate what can't be right. It can't be this because the integration doesn't match up. It can't be that because I don't have an OH peak in my IR. In my IR. All right, so let's do a practice where we don't have a structure or a formula, but we have only three real signals showing up. So first off, that peak splitting is a mess. I warned you it would be because it's right around seven, right? So regardless of what else there is, we've got a benzene ring. Mess of signals on top of each other between six and eight, it's benzene ring every time. Which is nice that NMR has that because IR didn't have one thing we could look at for a benzene ring, right? We could see if there were sp2 carbon hydrogens, but we couldn't say whether that was an alkene or a benzene ring. This, we can definitively say that's a benzene ring. Yeah, sometimes they can shift left to right a little bit, depending on if you have like a fluorine attached to it or an OH attached to it, it's going to move a little bit left to right. So without even knowing the formula or an IR, we know it's a, got a benzene ring. And this, this one doesn't even give us an integration. And these peaks are so, so tall and skinny, you can't just look at it, the size and, and eyeball the integration. Doesn't really work out if you try that. So 
let's ignore integration for this one. We know we've got a benzene ring. And if we look over here, we've got something with three peaks furthest to the right. So probably a methyl with two nearest neighbors. And then we've got something more to the left with four peaks. If it's four peaks, what does that tell us? How many nearest neighbors? Three, Three nearest neighbors. So we know we have, a, we're pretty sure we have a methyl next to CH2 or next to something with two protons. And we're pretty sure we've got something here that's next to three protons. So what's one possible structure without even looking at the integration, what's one possible structure that that could be? Yeah, we know we have a benzene ring. We've got a methyl group. It's the most shielded for this to the right. That's next door to two hydrogens. And then we've got something that's more de-shielded. So it, a secondary carbon would fit the bill for that next door to three hydrogens. And then a benzene ring, which we can't from the signal tell or without the integration tell 100%. If we had the integration here though, what we would expect to see is, if we call this our smallest one, one is that's our normal procedure. This one would look like 1.5. And that one would look like 2.5, which tells us it's not really one, right? Can't have half of a proton. What's that, what's that measurement again? So it's the integral, which, which is the area under the curve. And sometimes you see it written as, you see it written like this is just like a red line on top of the signals and how much the red line rises is that's the the sum of the integral and so if it goes from say that it goes from here to here that increase in height represents the area under this curve from left to right yeah and and it should be in its the integral is proportion, proportional to the number of hydrogens. And so we can look at this integral and just treat it like this number relative to this rise should be a whole number. If this is one hydrogen, that should be a whole number of hydrogens as well. Integration. Integration. Calculus term. Remember taking the integral of things? It's integrating is the process of taking an integral and the integration is the area under the curve. Same, same way you did it. We wouldn't actually integrate this by, you know, using calculus rules though. It'd be just like you did for the GC where you have a whole bunch of data and you just sort of add up tiny rectangles to get an idea of what the integral is. And really, I don't even think that there's really a, another valid structure. This one is a pretty, even without the integration, we know there has to be a benzene ring and there's have to be two other sources of protons and they're not both methyls, right? Because then they would both have different integration here. Well, I know you said that methyls 
the field of light is small. But all X plus constants, which is just like the streets themselves. So the one that's furthest to the right has three peaks, which means it has two nearest neighbors. Okay, that's, that's it. So the, the integration and the multiplicity are easy to get swapped because multiplicity, the number of peaks is for the neighbors. The integration is for this hydrogen. All right, we'll do one more before we take a break. And this is one that's um, where I'm going to give you an IR and a formula, and we'll, we'll write out some possibilities, and then we'll look at the NMR, and we'll try and nail it down. Between an NMR and an IR and a formula, that's usually enough to get really close to the, to the actual structure. If, it, if there's a benzene ring involved, it's not always enough to figure out are they on carbon one and two or carbon one and three, but it's usually enough to get really close. So IR, we haven't spent as much time in this class on, but it's also a little bit simpler in a lot of ways because there's less information really, right? There's really only four things you normally look for on an IR. Anybody remember what they are off the top of your head? The first thing you look for, an OH group. We'd be looking at a big rounded peak over here, right? Or if it was a, a carboxylic acid, it'd be really broad. And we don't see that, which is helpful, right? Because the, the absence of a peak on an IR tells us a lot too, right? It means we don't have an OH, despite we have oxygens, but we don't have any OHs. Okay, what's the next thing we look for? SP3 versus SP2, right? And it was anything, so I put the line in here for you, and I'll do this on the test as well. You can put, you can put a line at 1500 and align it at 3000, so it makes it pretty obvious to, to see. So anything to the left of 3000, any of these sharp little peaks to the left of 3000 was an SP2 carbon hydrogen, correct? And anything to the right, was SP3. So we don't have any SP2 CHs. Doesn't mean we don't have any SP2 carbons, but we don't have any SP2 carbons that have hydrogens on them, which means probably no benzene ring as well. And because it'd be pretty rare to have a benzene ring where all six of the carbons had their hydrogens replaced with something else. Not saying it couldn't happen, but it would be it'd be pretty uncommon. And we don't we don't have enough atoms for that actually anyway. The exception is there the aldehyde hydrogens do show up to the right of 3000, they show up around 2800, which that may be an aldehyde there. It might also just be another SP3 carbon hydrogen. So we don't know for certain but that's one possibility. And the nice thing about aldehydes is that's the carbon hydrogen bond for an aldehyde shows up around 2800. The carbon oxygen 
bond in an aldehyde is what the next thing we're supposed to look for, right? Do we have any carbonyls? Because where do they show up? Yeah, right, right there. Right, nice and clean. You actually couldn't ask for a more obvious one right there. It's above 1500, nice sharp peak right in the region we'd expect for an out for a carbonyl. And there's only one of them. So we might have two oxygens, but only one of them is an aldehyde or only one of them is carbonyl, unless they happen to be, if this was a perfectly symmetrical molecule, you could have both aldehydes showing up in the same peak here. It'd be unusual, but it could happen. So we have an aldehyde. We could have two aldehydes, but we don't have another carbonyl. Because if we had another carbonyl, this would be two peaks. So our other oxygen is either identical to the first one, if it was perfectly symmetrical, or it's not a carbonyl. And actually, we can answer that one right now, too. Because look at the formula. What does that formula tell us? It could be symmetrical. True. But what about the number of hydrogens relative to carbons? It's double. It's not 2n plus 2. Right? If it's saturated, if everything is sigma bonds only, then we should have 2n plus 2 hydrogens. Right? So saturated, just regular hexane is C6H14. If you're missing, for every pair of hydrogens that you're missing, we call that one degree of unsaturation, a pair of hydrogens that's missing is either a pi bond, because a pi bond takes away one sigma bond from each of the atoms involved, right? Or it's a ring. Because a ring, you don't have two CH3s on the end of your chain anymore, right? You connected your chain at both ends. So hexane is C6H14, cyclohexane is C6H12. So the fact that this, we have 12 hydrogens and six carbons, can we have more than one carbonyl? If we had more than one carbonyl, what would that, let's just draw it out and see what that formula would look like. One, two, three, four, five. So that would be symmetrical enough to give us only one carbonyl peak. And it's C6O2, but there's only 10 hydrogens. So the, the formula, like we don't just want to read the spectra and then make and then figure out if what we drew matches the formula. The formula actually allows us to eliminate things as well. So we can't have a benzene ring because we only have six carbons and we have 12 hydrogens. So our degree of unsaturation is only one. We only have one pi bond or ring out of the whole molecule. And we're also pretty certain that we have a carbonyl, which means we can't have any more rings or any more pi bonds in there. We have an aldehyde and that's it when it comes to pi bonds. All right, anything else we can tell about from the IR? That's 
And that's all the obvious information anyway, right? Look at your CHs, look for your OH, look for carbonyls. So this is this is in that fingerprint region. Anything to the right of that of 1500. And if you don't have the fingerprint database, I have, it's more like palm reading, where you're going to find whatever you're looking for because there's so many peaks in there, um, and they all tend to be on top of each other. So basically, stay out of there unless you're really certain you already know the structure. Then you could probably go back and figure out what that biggest peak was for. But you don't want to try and get to the structure by using the fingerprint region. It's tempting because that is a nice big peak, but there are just too many things on top of each other down there. We could already eliminate any uh, hydroxyls. So we have so no hydroxyls. So it can't be a carboxylic acid. It can't be an alcohol. So what else is there for an oxygen? We have, we have to do something. We have one more oxygen, right? Can't be a ketone. That's, a, that's another carbonyl. So what's left? What's the only other thing that puts an oxygen in our structure without giving it an H or a pi bond is an ether. So we're probably going to have something that looks like this. It's possible. So an ester would be if we had if our carbonyl, if we looked like this, except that we did have a peak that, that looked like it might be an aldehyde hydrogen. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about the NMR is aldehyde hydrogens show up in, in very specific spots. So if we have an aldehyde, the NMR will confirm it. And if we don't have an aldehyde, then an ester is probably our next best bet. Because we gotta do something with that carbonyl and that other oxygen that's not a hydroxyl. So assuming that I'm showing you all of the peaks, one, two, three, four, five, Five peaks, six carbons, right? Five peaks means five carbons that have hydrogens on them. And our last carbon is a carbonyl. So every single one of our carbons is unique because they're, each carbon that has a hydrogen gives us a separate signal. And we don't see anything. This was, I zoomed out again already. This is only four right here. And we go back to our table of frequencies. Aldehydes show up all the way around 10. So not an aldehyde. basically 100% not an aldehyde, it can't be an aldehyde, which is, why, which is a good reason why we put a question mark there. Because it looks like, if we didn't put a question mark there when we were writing this, it looks like we have a contradiction, right? But the question mark reminds us that, oh yeah, on that IR, there was a peak that could have been an aldehyde hydrogen, but maybe not. We know we have a, carb a carbonyl for sure. Maybe that little guy has an aldehyde, maybe not. Looks like not now. Right, so that allows us to cross that out. So no OHs, no sp2 carbon hydrogens, other than maybe an aldehyde, but then we cancel it off. Definitely a carbonyl. So we either have a ketone and an ether separately, or we could have an ester where the two oxygens are right next to each other. And so we can have so ketone 
looks like this and an ether looks like this, or we could have the ester, which is kind of like both of them at the same time. going to be kind of hard to pick between those just off the chemical shifts without looking at that chart. So let's go back and look at that chart. See if there's anything about esters or ketones or ethers that might give us some more information. So ethers should show up in this range, looks like between, between three and three and a half. We got nothing there. So it's not an ether, it's gotta be an ester, right? So it's either a ketone and an ether or an ester. So we have to use both of our oxygens. So let's see if there's anything about esters in here. Uh, ketones sort of show up in the middle right next to each other. Hydroxyls have a really broad range. Doesn't say anything specifically. A ketone would be around two and a half. So nothing specifically that calls it out as an as an ester. All right, which is okay because that just means now we know it's an ester. It's just a matter of trying to say, okay, how, what do we have on each side? What are the two things attached to both sides of our ester? This one's going on. We'll stop there. We'll take a break since we blew right through break time. So I thought this was going to be a quicker one. We're taking our time. Um, let's come back in 10 minutes and then we'll finish this up. And then we'll review competing mechanisms was the other topic we were going to go over today, but it's just the same that we've talked about it before. Um, so that actually fits in well for next lecture for our review as well. Um, so if all we do for the rest of the day is get through this, I'm okay with that. It is. It's a lot like puzzles. It can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take a look at that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like a oh. expensive something, but it's a uh, twenty three. Okay. So, uh, I'll ask her about that. You need to slice them salt. Is what I got. So, okay. Cool. I'll try that. Don't just fight into it. Yeah. Like Whoa. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Red. You know what they're doing class today? The definition of class. Yep, free time and lock. And then I heard that that last last Tuesday's lecture, the recording stopped halfway through. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, that the IR we it feels like I said, it feels like you're just making stuff up because there's so many possibilities with it. Um, but at the same time, you're not supposed to do more than you know, look at those three main things. So we nothing, nothing in there that we didn't get, get to today. Maybe we covered waves and things like that in physics. So you have an idea of what we're what's going on. Right. Yes. Different bonds have different different spring constants, basically. Yeah. Um, which means, yeah, you, 
hit it with the right frequency and it absorbs. I'm just curious, it's like, I wonder if any of them when you're doing this. Um, they can if you get to really high intensities, but that and um, but generally, generally not until you get up to UV. Um, same same things you know going on in your cells, right? It's the same compounds, really, same functional groups. So yeah, it doesn't. It would probably evaporate before you broke the sigma bond. Other than maybe if you had a really acidic hydrogen, you might be able to get that hydrogen to fly off, which is one of the reasons why carboxylic acids show up as a super broad peak because there's a lot of different possible frequencies they can absorb because they have all these interactions with each other. And if you take the hydrogen off of it, that changes everything else's frequencies a little bit. And so you just wind up with it swallowing everything else up basically because there's so many possible frequencies that can absorb. So far I know that benzene and blue show up as well because it has more possible interaction with resonance. Right? It's going to be scarce. Um, so it has it has resonance. It has some. So sterics just means things pushing on other things. So it has some of those interactions as well. It doesn't show up as broad. It shows up to the left, and for whatever reason, they they draw these so that the highest energy light is on the left, and lowest energy is on the right. Um, so basically, the spring constants are stiffer when you when you have um, an sp2 carbon hydrogen so it shows up at a higher energy and same with ben with the carbon hydrogen bonds on a benzene they're stiffer because the hydrogen is actually stuck to the carbon a little bit tighter and it's one of those things once a year i think about why the heck they they label it from right to left i've gotten so used to it this is just what they look like um, and you know, alcohols are always on the left, and fingerprints always on the right. But I don't, I don't know why. And I was also curious when you asked what the percentage of information is in the um, Yes. Yes. So percent transmittance is 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 kind of what it sounds like. It's literally the percentage of photons that make it through. Oh, okay. So that don't make it through. Right. But the problem is it's not the same as 100 minus absorbs, absorbance because absorbance is an absorbance is what's proportional to concentration. So percent transmittance is handy for looking at IR spectra, but absorbance is the way you actually calculate concentration. And the relationship is, it's an exponential relationship because absorbance maxes out at a two. I want to say it's e to the absorbance is equal to a constant times e to the percent transmittance as a decimal or something like that. Maybe there's a negative in there. So a high percent transmittance is a low absorbance. Yeah. I don't just want that. It's hard to see this one the stars and foggy and it is log base 10. So absorbance is log base 10 of, of uh, transmittance. I is just intensity of light. So, and that's there's your inverses I naught over I instead of the other way around. Um, and if you switch those, you get the negative. So, it's basically, luckily, we don't, we don't. don't use them for the same things ever. If you have percent transmittance, you can get to absorbance, but if you're talking numbers, you're going to use absorbance because it's tied to concentration. If you're just talking 
IR spectra qualitatively, you're talking percent transmittance because that's easier to measure. And really those, um, those spectra photometers that we used, that we used in GenChem to measure um, concentrations and stuff, they actually measure these two numbers and then have the transform in there to get to absorbance. Yeah. Do it. Sean, you get my you get my note from uh, last night. My my conscience got the best of me. I, I already graded you. I, I knew that you were late. I still graded yours. You're fine. No, no, I requested a zero because it wasn't my work. I just skimmed the internet and found what, what the best. I just have to lengthen out and but I still can't back that because I'm still like behind. So. Well, you couldn't have gotten the answers directly from the internet to the quiz because. Because I wrote those questions. So if you skim the internet and you turn that into your answer to the quiz, that's a lot. All right. That's okay. That was uh they're open if it, was the, if it was an official test, I would I would uh, yeah. Then I would, then I would appreciate your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I got some catch up to the mechanism table was a test That's okay. That's normal to feel that way, especially for this class, especially this time in the quarter. Yeah. It's been rough. Man, it's so freaking early. And I know everybody's doing it, but it's just hard. It is. The, the, unfortunately, the reason we had to do it at this time slot because um, because we couldn't put this class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday because of all the math and physics classes. Yeah. And we couldn't put it any later in the day on Tuesday, Thursday, because I teach between from 8 a.m. to um, 4 p.m. straight. Yeah, so there's like there's no other place you could put it. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to take it if it was anywhere else. Right. That, that's our thing. It's, it's yeah. awful. I don't like 8 a.m. class. Either. Yeah. Zoomed all yes. I actually I used that for AP Chem in high school. That is the same edition, so that's a little bit older. That one's not mine. Um, but that's Zoomed all is a really common Gen Chem. Yeah, yeah. And then this got sent to me as a as an evaluation copy. They wanted me to take this for OCHEM. Um, and I so I've never talked from it, but it's got all the same stuff as as our OCHEM textbook. Um, this is a slightly different order. It has, I, I like the figures. This is actually my second choice um, for the textbook we would go with because it is 165 is not cheap, but compared to, yeah, for three quarters, it's not that bad. Yeah, you got that. Yeah, you got that. I don't know that long. All right. So let's recap where we left off. I said it had to be an ester, right? Because it's not an aldehyde 
and it can't be carboxylic acid, can't be anything with an OH. The only thing, the only way we could fit two oxygens on this molecule without breaking, without contradicting something was for it to be an ester. And the nice thing about esters is that there's only so many ways we can arrange them. If we know it's an ester, just from the formula, the second we know it's an ester, we only have four possibilities. Granted, they all look pretty similar, but there's the NMR has enough information. We can probably decide, we can at least narrow it down because some of the splitting is going to be different from these, right? Because we're going to have, for this one, for all of them, we're going to have three CH2s, right? But the splitting on those CH2s and the splitting on our methyls are going to be allow us to tell whether we have a methyl next to no nearest neighbors or a methyl next to two nearest neighbors. Right? So if we if it's either the top or the bottom options, one of our methyl groups should have no splitting, right? Because this methyl has no nearest neighbors. And this methyl has no nearest neighbors. So now knowing that, we can come over here and say, okay, well, our two peaks all the way to the right both have multiplicity of three, right? So that tells us it can't be the top or the bottom. So well, that was easy. Can we work out some way we could do the same thing or use similar logic between these two? So in both cases, we're going to have a CH2 next to a methyl. So we should have a CH2 with a multiplicity of four in both cases, right? So that doesn't really help us because we just look down here, there's a multiplicity of four. But these others, so these were our two methyls. They're furthest to the right. They both have a multiplicity of three which means that they only have two nearest neighbors. And if we're checking our integration, that's our way to our smoking gun for methyls here. We already think they're methyls. And when we compare them to our integration, it's definitely bigger than that one, right? Integration of about, it's about one and a half times is 50% bigger. Each of these is 50% bigger than these ones. So these three are our CH2s. Brad? Uh, just about four. All right, so we should have at least one CH2 with a multiplicity of four. And actually, only one CH2 with multiplicity of four, right? Because this CH2 has three nearest neighbors. If it's multiplicity of four, it has to have three nearest neighbors, right? That's got three nearest neighbors. That's got two. That's got five. So, in both cases, only one CH2 is going to have a multiplicity of four. And it's the one that's furthest to the left. That might be enough to hint which of these two it is, right? The one that's the most de-shielded is the CH2 that has a multiplicity of four. So which of these two would make more sense? Maybe the bottom one is directly attached to an oxygen. So we might think that that should be the most de-shielded. It's not enough all on its own. 
to do that, to, to make that conclusion, because resonance can do some funny things. Even though this CH2 is one carbon away from the oxygens, it's in an allylic position to the that pi bond, right? And that can do some funny things. So we're leaning towards this one. If it's this one, the others, we should have a CH2, if it's, sorry, if it's this one, our other two CH2s, we should have a CH2 with a multiplicity of three, because two nearest neighbors, should be the next most downfield, right? Hmm. Multiplicity of three, and then multiplicity of six, right? Because five nearest neighbors for these hydrogens. If it was, is there anything that would allow us to distinguish between these though? We kind of have to go with, with our gut a little bit or go back to that chart and see if there's anything we can we can distinguish, right? If it was a mixture of both, we'd be seeing peaks for both compounds because they are two distinct compounds. That carbon hydrogen or those protons are not the same energetically as those ones. And so we would be seeing 10 peaks on top of each other, which would be really confusing for only having five distinct hydrogens. So what needs to drop the structure of the table there for? Ideally, yes. Yeah. So sometimes you have a little, little noise, so you'll have some impurity, but usually the integration doesn't match up because you, for the integration to work out to be a whole numbers, you have to have them in the same concentrations. So if you have just a little bit of impurity, it'll show up as you know maybe a tiny signal down here, but the integration will be like 0.1 or something. So, but yes, we do try to get them as pure as possible because otherwise it makes this part impossible to, to actually figure out. So yeah, this should be, in both cases, we're gonna have a quartet, a triplet, in a sextet. So then it's just a matter of, okay, well, which one's more downfield? And so we can, our instinct is to say that it's this bottom choice because our quartet is directly attached to an oxygen. So let's go back to that chart and see if that chart will give us any more clarity here. So ethers, which an ester is not an ether, but it does have a carbon directly attached to an oxygen. So it's similar to an ether. Shows up more downfield than a ketone. And so that kind of answers our question about whether that pi bond was doing something with resonance. The ketone has a carbonyl with a, with a sp3 carbon attached to it, right? So that, in other words, that's similar to being in this position. It's not the exact same, but it's close. And in, and a ether, did I say that wrong? A ketone would be similar to this side. And an ether would be similar to this side because you've got a sp3 carbon directly attached to an oxygen with a sigma bond. So the fact that on this chart, our ethers are further downfield than our ketones tells us our instinct was right. And the atoms that are directly attached to the oxygen are more de-shielded. So the most de-shielded out of our four out of our three CH2s should be this carbon. And it should be a quartet if it's the bottom one, which is what we saw. All right, so it gets a little bit tricky sometimes getting all the way down to your final choice sometimes because if you have two isomers that are really close. It's, it's also, you know, maybe not a full credit answer, but it's an acceptable answer to say, well, I can't conclusively decide between these two. It's one of these two, I'm fairly certain. 
I'm not 100% sure out of these two. And then, you know, in this, this NMR chart is also not the, the end all be all. There are other NMR charts out there that might distinguish between um, esters. So let me just pull up our textbook. These are the lab textbooks that you guys don't have. And I may have actually gone the wrong way because it might actually be inside the back. Oh, there it is. Which is really hard to read. Let's see if zooming in gets us anywhere. Not really on this screen. I thought I had a better copy of this one. There, that'll do. It is inside the back cover. So we're looking at esters. So there's a ketone, there's an ester. So the ketone, the carbonyl side of an ester shows up between 2.1 to 2.5. And the other side of an ester, 3.5 to 4.1. So again, confirms what we were just thinking. This is more, more explicitly because comparing ketones to esters is dicey because they're not the same functional group. But this more in deep, this one's not as fun to look at, um, but this one has more details specifically. And it's one of the reasons why, why the other chart probably doesn't bother to include that is 3.5 to 4.8 is a really broad range, right? But when we're trying to decide between left side of the key of the ester versus right side of the ester just knowing that it's more downfield more de shield that's all we were look, really looking for right and this confirms that so see this one and so that was i don't know almost almost uh, 45 minutes on to answer one question um but like i said i'm not going to give you a question that's that tricky on the time part of the test. That's more of a lab final question. Like did that that basically is your lab final. Once you figure out and get your your pure your substance purified as much as you can from lab, um, I will I'm going to make a note of who's doing what substance um, and uh, or what plant, and then I'm going to give you an NMR and an IR for a component of the essential oil. The essential oils that you all are doing for your lab finals um, are not pure substances. One of the reasons that, that lemon oil and clove oil are used in that lab is because they basically are just one compound in those essential oils. Um, the ones you are using are not, which is on purpose, kind of. Um, it's partly because I didn't want to give you clove oil and lemon oil again since you already did that, but it's also so that I can pick one component more or less at random and give you an NMR and an IR for it. So you can't get your answer just by Googling it. Because if you Google essential oil of lemongrass, it's, you're gonna find it has 17 different compounds in it. And I gave you one of them. Um, so you can't just look it up. Um, you're saying that my grass is lemongrass. Yeah, and I will tell you so. <laughs> The, the three the three unknown plants, I don't, I don't have a problem telling you what the plants are. It's lemongrass, coriander, and cinnamon. Okay. But there's compounds in, there's, I'm giving you spectra that I want you 
the analyzer for one of the compounds out of those essential oils. Right. And so that's basically just what we just did. You won't have the formula even. Actually, I don't remember if I gave you the formula or not. I'll double check that. But I'll write an announcement later today. It says, okay, for those of you who had coriander, here's your spectra. For those of you who had lemongrass, here's your spectra. For those of you who had cinnamon, here's your spectra. And I'll give you an IR and an NMR and maybe a, I think a formula too. So just like this one we just went through. Right? Just to clarify the IR practice, I thought you said there's four points to the criteria. One was the OH, no OH, SP2, SP3. I think that the last one was was um, was aldehydes. I think I had that called out separately because it shows up in a separate region than the other carbon hydrogens. Yeah. Um, if I'm remembering my slides right, I think that that's... It, the, the three so biggest so ones, though, were the carbonyl, the CHs and the OHs. Red. Aldehydes, alkyne, terminal alkynes, because only the CHs, I think, right? Or was do alkynes? Hang on. Okay. The alkynes probably have a distinct, they probably have something in that middle region that's usually empty between like 1700 and, and 2800. Brad, what was your question? Mm -hmm. It's so I don't know that that's accurate. I, iodine is a better nucleophile. Actually, no, it's a, iodine is a if you're in a protic solvent, iodine is a better nucleophile than fluoride. If it's aprotic, those are reversed. So so iodine is a decent leaving group under all conditions. Um, and but it is really when you're and that all of the halogens are better leaving groups than most any of the bases that we're talking about, um, especially if it's something with a negative charge, it's going to be a, most of those are better nucleophiles um, than iodine, which means iodine is a better leaving group. Though, and they're related, right? If it's a good nucleophile, it's a bad leaving group. Um, let me, oh, sorry, I was just looking, clarify here on the, um, so alkynes, the carbon-carbon bond for an alkyne or a nitrile do show up in this area where nothing else shows up. So that is one thing you can look for. If you do have something, most of the things we care about show up between 28, either above 2800 or below 1700. If you do get a peak right in the middle, you might have a triple bond, either a nitrile or an alkyne. Those are about the only things that show up right there in the middle. Um, and if it's a terminal alkyne, then you actually wind up with, then you have one of those carbons has a hydrogen attached. A terminal means at the end of a chain. So if it's a terminal alkyne, then you have something that looks like this. This bond shows up right in the middle, like we were just talking about. And this bond, shows up even further to the left than a C, than an sp2 carbon hydrogen bond so this right here so there's that's an alkyne and that's an alkene and and where's our no i'm not zoomed in enough i can't read that i think i circled the wrong things So alkane, aka sp3, sp2s, 
are right here, and then sp carbon hydrogen bonds are even further to the left. So alkynes are pretty distinctive, and especially if it's a terminal alkyne, you have to have both of those. You have to have something way to the left. It's pretty narrow and also very strong. So it won't look like an oxygen, like an OH group. And you have to have something right here in the middle. That's your carbon carbon stretching. Okay, so that is, and that was our fourth point on those was um, you can um, you can look for some of those other less common but still really easily identifiable if you know to look for them groups like a nitrile or an alkyne. They don't show up very often though. So usually you'll just see an empty space there. All right. Well, excellent work this quarter, everyone. That's all of our new material. On Thursday's lecture, we'll be doing review and going over more practice on how do we decide which mechanism we should favor, because there is a little bit of gray area there. It takes a little bit of practice to figure that out. And we'll go over the answers to the quiz in more detail um, then. Um, you, and if you can't wait till then, then uh, I have office hours at uh, three today. Fred? Um, only if you need to. If you need to finish something up in lab, we can do that. But I think they're going to be starting construction on lab as well. So we might, that might be a moving target. We might be doing lab in here or something like that without access to a Greenwood. Um, because they basically, they have between our last class in lab and January 5th, to move the fume hoods to a portable out there. They're not, so that's a pretty big, and move furniture, the benches are getting moved to the old dance studio out there. Um, so they want to start working on that as soon as possible so they can actually have it done and ready for us by then. Um, and I'm still a little bit skeptical. So I want to give them all the time possible. Uh, but we'll find some way to, to do um, lab during finals week if you need to finish up your lab final. Thank you.